Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Do you have a ministry? But do you wonder why doors aren't opening up to you? There's a second part to not just being called. There's a point called separation. And what stands between those two is just being faithful to God. Today, we're going to talk about calling and separation. So get ready to be blessed. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandy and I hope you're having a good day. You're about to have a better day with the Word of God. I want you to open up with me today to Romans chapter one and verse one. While you're finding that particular verse of scripture, I want to thank all those who are watching today. And if, you, if you're here for the first time, watching for the first time, welcome to the broadcast. I am called to be a teacher in the body of Christ. I was a pastor for 33 years, still am a pastor as far as I'm concerned. And uh, anyway, I just teach throughout the word of God. Love to teach verse by verse, open up scripture, show you things in the word of God that God's revealed to me and uh, just make it a, a great day of blessing in the things of God. And so again, if you're a partner with me in the ministry, thank you so much, been watching for some time. Or if you've been watching from the very beginning or even followed my ministry long before I got on television, thank you again for just being faithful to serve God, but also to consider me as part of those servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, that you support with your with the ministry here for a student of the word. So again, thank you so much. If you'd like to become a partner with those devoted people that are following the Lord and following me and uh, look to me for the teaching and things of the word of God, then please go to my website, bobbyandian.com, and you'll find a place there where you can become a partner with me. And again, it's Thank you again ahead of time for just listening to God or else just choosing to be a part of the broadcast and the partner team that again makes this possible. Romans chapter one and verse one, Paul says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and separate unto the gospel of God. I wanna point out to you, there's two things he mentions in this verse of scripture. First of all, call to be an apostle. Next of all, separate unto the gospel of God. Uh, this book I'm offering to you call calling and separation, the title of this particular broadcast, is one of my best-selling books. The reason why is because most people just think if you're called in the ministry, then you, doors start opening and you just go out there and start preaching. That's just not true. Calling is only the first part. Paul also mentions something else, separated under the gospel of God. And so when you're first called in the ministry, there is no open doors. It's just simply the fact you know you have a calling, but then God begins to look at you. In other words, calling is of God, but separation is of you. You are the one who forms the separation. In between the calling and the separation, Separation comes a great time of just showing yourself faithful to do whatever your hand can find to do. In other words, if like me, you're called to be a teacher, I knew I was called to be a teacher. Didn't know later on I'd be a pastor. I just knew I was called to be a teacher in the body of Christ. I look for any open door in our church. I didn't ask to be paid. I didn't ask to be put on staff. I didn't look for some traveling ministry, announcing myself to churches who didn't know who in the world I was. I just started because I knew my pastor and I asked him if there's anything I could do. At first he said no, then later from the pulpit he said, uh, we need somebody to teach a Sunday school class. And I was up there in no time saying, what is it? He said, seventh grade boys. I said, I will just take it. I just want some place to vent and teach these things out that God has been showing me. And of course, within a few weeks, I found out I was over their head and the pastor then came to me after hearing of what I was teaching to these seventh grade boys, put me in the uh, class teaching college and career. I I was teaching Oral Roberts University students in there. And man, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. In fact, as far as I was concerned, I would have done that for the rest of my life. No pay, just a volunteer position in the church but just a place I could go and study and then release it in the class. I'd take the quarterly we had, which was literally telling you what to speak on, and it would have just a, a scripture and a general outline, which they, which you could fill in yourself. I was great. I mean, I studied ahead for those things and looked in the Word of God and had my teachings, and they began to grow and grow and grow to where eventually then in the church that started out of that church, which I joined, they gave me a full Sunday night service with the, with the entire congregation. So from there, it developed into teaching at uh, Bible college. And then later on, I pastored a church for 33 years. So again, it starts off with that. God has a calling on your life, but he looks to you 
to be faithful to him to where finally he will separate you. And in Romans chapter one, Paul says this, that he was called to be an apostle, but then later separated into the gospel of God. So Paul begins his book of Romans with a twofold aspect of his ministry, again, calling and separation. And Paul's ministry began supernaturally on the road to Damascus. Let me just say this. If all you have is a knowing in your heart that you're called into the ministry, that is supernatural. It may not seem as supernatural to you as you riding down the road and getting knocked down to the ground and God actually speaking to you, but you weren't in the shape that Saul of Tarsus was. You weren't killing Christians. And God, as dramatic as Saul was killing Christians, thinking he was serving God, God had to smite him, knock him on the road to grab his attention. So just be thankful that all God took with you was just calling you. You just had a knowing inside of you that became stronger through the days that you're called to be a teacher or whatever in the body of Christ. So Jesus appeared to him in a blinding light. And the Lord told Ananias to lay hands on him and we receive his sight. I mean, everything around the, the new birth of Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, was incredible. The Lord also told Ananias that Paul was a chosen vessel to carry the name of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. All this happens in the book of Acts, Acts chapter nine. And God had known this long before it was revealed to Ananias and then eventually revealed to Paul. Paul was called to be an apostle before he ever learned it. And later he was separated to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll find out when that was. The Greek word for calling is kaleo. It means to summon or to call out loud. In other words, there's something about it that it's more than just a simple knowing inside. It's either a strong knowing or the Lord will speak to you through someone and then verify what he's talked in your heart. Once God calls, he begins to show you the verifications. He begins to amplify that and verify that, that you have truly been called into the ministry. It could be a word from somebody, or it just could be somebody again that comes to you and just says, you know, I just sense about you. There's a call on your life. On top of that, doors begin to open up in small areas, and God wants to know if you'll be faithful to do that. And then the word separation means to set apart by boundaries, that God has a boundary for your ministry. It doesn't mean because you're called in the ministry and then finally separated, you can do every ministry possible. No, there's a certain ministry for you. God has put boundaries around you. And some people have the idea that if God calls them into the ministry, they're called into the ministry total. They can do anything, more like an apostle. They can preach, they can teach, they can evangelize. And there may be elements of those in your ministry, but God specifically sets you into a calling. And that calling might again have some other little things around it, but there's the main boundary set apart there. He was called and he was separated. His ministry ended up being an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could he pastor? Yes, but that was not his eventual thing. What Paul loved to do and what his calling was on his life to do, which he actually again fulfilled, was to come into a place where the name of Jesus was not known to preach. And then also he started out as an evangelist. He would have signs and wonders and miracles accompanying him. I think of Acts chapter 19, where uh, so, uh, Paul went to the city of Ephesus and that lasted over three years, that revival that was there. And through that, then again, signs and wonders and miracles. He taught the word of God. He preached. Uh, people were called in the ministry. Opposition came against him, but he established churches while he was there. That came out in the next chapter, chapter 20. So he not only came in as an evangelist, saw people get saved, but also he taught the people and preached to the people. Signs and wonders came, which was the ministry again of an evangelist. Then he began to establish churches. Those churches arose. He helped establish those churches. And in chapter 20, came back and talked to all the ministers there. Paul, in essence, could do a little bit of everything, but his main calling was to go into a place and, and literally raise up a ministry that was not there to start with. Let's talk about his time of separation. There was probably some, maybe up to 14 years between between his calling, which he received on the road to Damascus, and then later when God separated him. And by now he had just been proving himself over and over again to the Lord, to where finally the Lord separated him. In Acts chapter 13, the church of Antioch, in verses one and two, it says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, such as Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, this probably came through one of the prophets. It was mentioned in verse one. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Here we have 
both words mentioned again. Calling and then separation came in Romans chapter one, but here we have separate now, separate at this time, me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work we're into, I have called them. Paul's time of separation came years after his calling. Again, almost 14 years had elapsed between the call on the road to Damascus and the time of separation at the church of Antioch. And I want you to notice the phrases used by the Holy Spirit in verse two. Separate me is present tense and have called is past tense. There's a period of time between the calling and the separation. And many people know they have a call to the ministry, but they never reach the point of separation. Why is that? It's because they think doors are supposed to open up for them, or now's the time to run out and start telling people you have a call to the ministry. I remember one day at church, there was a young man came. I, I pastored in Tulsa. I taught at Rama Bible Training Center for four years. I then became the pastor. And so many of the Rama students attended the church I was pastoring. So one September, about the time the school was about to begin on a midweek service on a Wednesday night, a young man came to me after the church service and said, I enjoyed your sermon. I said, great. He said, I'm a student at Rhema. I said, great, I can vouch for it. Good school, I taught there. He says, yes, I have a calling to pastor also. I said, well, that's good. And so he just stood there for a while. I, I kind of figured out, maybe I was missing the points. There's something I'm missing here. And he said, yes. He said, I told you I was called a pastor. I said, well, that's good. That's a good, again, I agree. That's a good calling. He still stood there and I said, what is it? He said, well, when can I preach from your pulpit? I said, when will you vacuum the floors? When will you work in the toilets and, and, and clean those out? When will you take and help in a youth class? When will you help in children's ministry? When will you greet at the front door or become an usher in this church? He looked at me and said, I told you I was called to preach. I said, well, you will never preach because if you won't do these things in preparation, you'll never reach the point of separation. This is what comes between calling and separation, a willingness to do anything, a willingness that without even being known, you'll, they'll stick you in a back room somewhere with some children and ask you to teach them. And you'll keep thinking, who can see me back here? The pastor can't see me. No one can see me. Maybe the parents may know something about me. How am I ever going to reach the pulpit? How am I going to reach the point of it is, is God sees you. And the point of it is also a separation doesn't come from men. No, you do your part and the same God that called you will separate you because why? God is no matter where you are, he is there with you. And God sees what you're doing. People do not promote you in the ministry. It's not the pastor that called you. It's not the pastor that can separate you. There comes a time that within the church, they may see this and begin to use you more and more. But if the church just basically slams the door on you, and some pastors have looked at the goodness you have and seen it as competition and don't want it, God will open up another door for you. There's always a door God will open to you. And that in that way, what you find out is, I'm working as unto the Lord. I'm going to put my hand to the plow. I will not look back. I'm going to do what I find to do, what my hand finds to do. I'm going to do that in every position you have. You have to be willing to say, if God wants me to be an usher at this church from now until the day I die, I will be the most faithful usher you've ever seen. This is what God is looking for. That is the basis of promotion. We'll get more to this when we come back right after halftime, talking about calling and separation. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. 
Throughout the Word of God, when God called people in the ministry, they were already doing something at the time. And that time of separation came even later, but God looks for people that are doing something. Again, you know, in the church, it could be just looking for anything to do. We, you know, I've had those students tell me sometimes that we're going to Bible school, some from Oral Roberts University, some from Raymond Bible Training Center, others that just were coming to the church but knew they had a call on their life. Oftentimes they would tell me, but you know, the church this size, which we had a good sized church, I'm sure you have plenty of ushers and all that. My thing is, no, I don't. That's where God calls people from. It's my ushers and the, and the people that watch the front door. And, and it's the people that uh, help with the children's church and youth department that come to me one day and say, pastor, hate to leave this place, but God's got a call on my life and doors opened up. And I know this is exactly what God wants for me. That's the type of person I love to lay hands on and send out the door because this is what church is for. After pastoring for 33 years, we lost count because some of them I didn't even take count of. That by the time I had my last service, we had found over 110 ministries that came out of our church and gone around the world. And one pastor had a church in Nigeria of over 10,000. Others had churches of 50, 6,500. I mean, we can talk about all the different sizes of churches. We had missionaries go out of our church, evangelists go out of our church. Uh, you, again, you, again, you name it, we had them. And it's just like, to me, it was such a tremendous thing of knowing that I taught from the pulpit, be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. And people often who thought they had no particular ministry found it and then went out to be tremendous. We had one young man and his wife who were just, they were just faithful in the church, but God called them to a missions and they became one of the most successful missionaries in the uh, area of East Berlin uh, before the wall fell. And so tremendous things happened back during those days, great things for God. And again, but came because of faithfulness throughout the word of God, when God came and called a person into the ministry, there was still a point later on of separation. There was a time period between between the calling and separation, but they were already faithful. Uh, when God was looking for another king, he found David tending sheep. When God was looking for a deliverer for Israel, again, he approached uh, Moses while he was tending sheep and, the, and came by the burning bush. We find it with Elisha while he was plowing and we find Gideon on the threshing floor. That's when God approached him. They were doing something. And in the New Testament, Jesus called men who were fishermen, tax collectors already doing something. And then chapter six of Acts, what a tremendous verse of scripture is choose faithful men among you who shall be able to teach others also. And they found seven of them. And the first two mentioned on the list end up occupying the next two and a half chapters of the book of Acts. Stephen became a great teacher of the word of God. Philip became an evangelist. And again, we find it because they were just faithful in the church to help in the church. And they all they did basically in chapter six was just give uh, food and finances and take care of the women in the church. Uh, again, th those that lost their husbands, they were faithful in the church to take care of them. And from there, the great ministries begin. Nobody starts out behind the pulpit. You start out just serving people and getting that great call on your life and without money, doing it. Uh, we find that that thing about Paul himself is later on in his ministry. He never lost that aspect of serving people. He started out serving people and later on continued serving people. And this is what we find. We find on the time when he was at shipwreck on the island, and the people were freezing. They've been in the water for so long. We're laying on the shore, just freezing. Paul was the one that went around and collected wood. He's the one that went and collected sticks so they could have a fire. Even got bit by a serpent at that time, but that became an open door for him to see healings on the island. And so again, let's talk about Elisha's calling and separation. There's a period of time between the calling and the separation. Many people know they have a call into the ministry, but they never reach the point of separation. Why? Because the moment they have a call, they go running out there looking for a ministry. In other words, they want to preach, but they have nothing to preach. They have no personal connection with people, knowing what it's like to work in some place like a church, not get paid for it, not get much recognition, but knowing that you're doing it to God. Elisha's calling and separation. Whenever Elisha had the first calling into the ministry, he was plowing and the mantle was given to him. Elisha was plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen and Elijah came and threw that mantle on him. And listen, Elisha must have known he had a calling in the ministry. The mantle is what verified it. When he got recognition from the famous uh, prophet, Elijah, who came and threw that mantle around him, he turned around and followed him immediately. Then he even said, stop for a moment. And he ran back and slew one of the oxen 
and offered it as a sacrifice and then left. What was he doing? He was burning his bridges behind him. Elijah was not an easy man to deal with. He had up and down emotional wide swings in his life, but Elisha found that out and probably he followed Elijah for some 10 years before the mantle fell on him finally that he kept and that was his separation. So again, he left that and basically saying, I'm never gonna go back to this again. Why Why is that so important? Because when you get a call in the ministry, there's always a second voice that comes to you from Satan himself, offering you a job back in the world, making more money than you've ever made before, but you have to make up your mind. I have started this road. I'm not gonna look back. I'm gonna keep on going. So Elisha again was plowing when he was found. And then later on, after some 10 years, Elijah was taken into heaven. And at the Jordan River, that mantle fell on him permanently. In other words, when Elisha, Elisha had that mantle thrown around him from Elijah, he was called in the ministry, but Elijah took it back because Elisha was going to be his one that followed after him. He was going to be the one that was his helper. And so by being in that submissive position, just like those that surrounded Paul in his ministry, that team he had, this team was made up of two people, Elijah and Elisha. It's interesting too, during Elisha's time period while following Elijah, that the sons of the prophets, which were going to the school of the prophets, all were probably jockeying for position thinking, I'm better. I have a ministry because, and I've also gone to school. I have a diploma from the school of the prophets hanging on my wall, and surely I will be the one that will stand in that position. And whenever Elisha was following Elijah, I'm sure they were all betting out there, this farm boy can't possibly take this position. He has no pedigree. He has no no, anything. He hasn't taken Hebrew. He hasn't taken Greek. He hasn't taken the history of all the things up till now. He doesn't know that much about it. He probably didn't know that much about Moses and all the prophets before us. And they probably had every reason why Elisha couldn't fulfill it until that day when Elijah went to heaven. And this time the mantle didn't fall on any of the 50 that were out there watching what was going on. It fell back on Elisha. Why did God separate Elisha? Because he was faithful, faithful, faithful. Listen, you may be going to a Bible school, but you're not going to have doors open up to you because you've got a diploma on the wall. It comes back to the key of faithfulness. God is not going to say on that day when we stand before him in heaven, well done, good and qualified servant. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. God calls believers, but God separates disciples. And there's a time period between your calling and your separation, a time between also just like you're born again and that time when you reach discipleship, it's the same kind of a small pattern of what happens in the ministry. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. If you follow Buddha, you become a Buddhist. They call you a Buddhist. Why? Because I follow Buddha. But being a follower of Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. It takes a supernatural miracle. You become a follower of Jesus after you become a Christian. A Christian is a supernatural thing that happens in your life when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But a Christian who is a follower of Jesus becomes a disciple. Disciple definition is this, a follower of a leader or a teacher. Specific definition of what a, uh, a Christ, or what a disciple is, is one who is an understander of a teacher or a leader, and the passion and thinking of the teacher becomes the passion and thinking of the follower. Because you attend church regularly doesn't make you a disciple. A disciple wants to see others come to Jesus in his own personal life as much as he wants to see it happen in the church. A disciple cares as much about a dirty carpet in a church as he cares about a dirty carpet in his home. Peter was questioned and under pressure denied he was a disciple of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is more than a follower, but one who understands his leader. John as uh, as opposed to the other 11, he was a follower of Jesus and sought after his teaching. The other ones were kind of in and out. John was the one, again, that Jesus loved and he loved Jesus. John sought to understand the teaching of Jesus. And when all forsook Jesus, John remained behind and then stood by Jesus at the cross. It's no accident that all the marks of a disciple are found in the gospel of John. I'm gonna get into that here in just a second. But again, I wanna get back to Elisha. For 10 years, he stood behind Elijah, stood next to him and probably saw the same thing that we saw before he ever met Elijah and before Elijah ever met Elisha. 
is that these up and down, wide swing things happened in his life. He was an emotional wreck. There was times he was a follower of Jesus and one note from the queen saying she was going to kill him, he ran. I mean, this is the guy that stood up in front of all the 450 prophets of Baal and slew them, called down fire from heaven, outran Ahab's chariot, and the next morning got a note from the queen saying she's gonna kill him. She didn't mean it. If she really wanted to kill him, she wouldn't have sent a note telling him. She would have sent an assassin with a dagger, but he didn't come that way. This probably, this guy gave him the note, ran as fast as possible. He did not want to confront Elijah after his powerful day, the day it had before. But when Elijah saw that, he freaked out and ran. And he ran again from a note from the queen. And literally what happened was, she probably, her second thought was, I'd like to kill him. My, my first thought is, I'd like to kill him. The second thought is, maybe I could just scare him. And guess what? It worked. He was scared. Ran and was in a cave hiding there. And so we find by hiding there again, this is when he, when God kept trying to get him out of the cave and go back to ministry, would not do it. And finally, God said, I'm going to replace you with basically a farmer. You're going to find him plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. And there came the time of separation. And the time of separation came and, it, and, to, and he literally picked up where Elijah left off. He fulfilled Elijah's ministry. He didn't have the same personality. He didn't even operate in signs and wonders like Elijah did. Oh, he had twice as many miracles, but none of them were spectacular, calling down fire from heaven. He's not the one that, call, that called out and a drought occurred for three and a half years. No, that's not what happened. He said, Lily did behind the scenes and his main ministry was not to the public. Elisha's ministry was mainly in front of the school of the prophets. A different calling, a different, all that, but he still completed the same ministry because he picked up right where Elijah left off. Elijah's last miracle was Elisha's first miracle, the parting of the Jordan River. And when he put down his mantle and it parted and they went over, he went up into heaven. The mantle fell from heaven and fell on Elisha. He turned around and took that mantle, hit the water. It split and he went through the other way. And the 50 prophets that saw that said, this is the man that's taking his place. So in the word of God, again, we have the definitions of a disciple. Let me give those disciple definitions to you. John brings them out. First of all, a disciple is one who continues in the word of God, John chapter eight, verse 30 through 32. Next of all, he's one that loves his brothers and sisters, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And one that bears much fruit is the third definition, John chapter 15 and verse eight. A disciple, a strong disciple is what God is looking for. And then the time of separation comes. Maybe you have a call and you'd like to be separated, just continue being faithful to God and get a copy of the book. You'll find out here in just a moment how to do that. Have you ever wondered why some Christians who are obviously called and anointed by God never seem to move into the realm of success? We watch and wonder as they struggle, knocking on doors that never open, while others have opportunities knocking at their door. Why are so many called, but so few chosen? God has a ministry for everyone, and He rewards those who are faithful to His call. Learn the keys to finding and walking in God's purpose for your life with Bob Yandian's book, Calling and Separation. The Calling and Separation book is available for $10 plus shipping and handling. To order your copy, visit our website at bobyandian.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.